Once again, the reading material is Parapsychology by Richard S. Sproutin. Picking up where we left off. Since those pioneering days, the dream work evolved into the Gansfeld technique and the use of the free response method of eliciting ESP from subjects has grown to be a major part of psi research. Without realizing it, parapsychologists have, to a certain degree, recre recreated the psychoanalyst's couch in the lab. Not only are subjects practically reclining, in Gansfeld experiments at least, but they are expected to more or less free associate their images in the hope of picking up impressions of the target. Yet the parapsychologist's laboratory is not the psychotherapist's office, and the researcher's goals are very different from the therapist's. Among those parapsychologists using the Gansfeld technique, it is no secret that better ESP results seem to come from the labs and the researchers who, able, who are able to provide a warm, supportive, and caring atmosphere for their subjects. There are no statistics to back up this observation, yet it is as per pervasive, it is a pervasive bit of lab lore that probably has more than a grain of truth behind it. It was also an important clue for Carpenter, one that eventually led to a fresh perspective on the nature of the free response type of experiment, type of ESP experiment, rather. For Carpenter, the patient's attempt to gain a personal insight and understanding in psychotherapy and the subject's attempt to uncover the hidden ESP target were strikingly similar. Information about the ESP target may well be in the subject's unconscious, but how can one dredge it up and recognize it for what it is? Those are the same tasks facing the therapy patient with regard to deep emotional wounds or other problems. What is more, it may be naive of the research <laughs> it may be naive of the researcher to expect the subject's impression of the ESP target to be a straightforward graphic reproduction of the original. More likely, it will be transformed and given new personal meaning by the subject. A picture of a diner A picture of a diner may become an old chili house, laden with poignant memories and the sadness of a cooled friendship. Perhaps, speculated Carpenter, free response ESP sessions are really mini therapy sessions. And the best ESP results come from sessions that are most likely very good therapy sessions. The obvious way to explore these issues was to merge the therapy session with the free response experiment, and that is what Carpenter is trying to do. With such a novel approach, however, a certain amount of feeling one's way is needed. Carpenter started with several members of our staff and a few of the participants in our 1987 summer study program. Not all members of the group were clinically experienced, and the few first few sessions were awkward. Under Carpenter's guidance, a method gradually evolved among the group that facilitated the in-depth discussion of feelings and emotions while retaining an awareness that any part of the group meeting might bear on the ESP target. The pilot experiment ran for 12 sessions. As it progressed, technical details were ironed out, and a number of very striking hits left the group with a feeling that there was real promise in the technique. For example, in one of the later sessions, two of the group dominated the conversation. One talked about her vivid images of brightly painted red fingernails, and she did some role-playing on that theme. The second person saw himself as a tree with roots planted in the center of the group and his arms and fingers stretching toward people all over the world. When the time came to decide which of the four pictures was the ESP target, all agreed on a picture of a bright red telephone with an advertising copy touting the connections among people around the world. It was the target. In the pilot series, about half of the trials produced direct hits, where one quarter is expected by chance. But the group did not need statistics to encourage them to continue. Carpenter and his group then embarked on, the first, on their first formal study. Twenty sessions were planned using the same group technique. This time, however, both the therapeutic quality of the sessions and the ESP results seemed more variable. By session eight, the group had the feeling that the better sessions therapeutically were also producing better ESP results. To assess this impression scientifically, they began to rate the quality of the session before leaving the room to discover the target. In their rating scheme, higher numbers reflected sessions of greater intensity, spontaneity, risk, and depth. 
the overall results for the 20 sessions were disappointing. The results were exactly at chance. However, when they grouped the results by the session quality ratings, something interesting emerged. The sessions that earned high ratings, reflecting greater intensity and depth, produced six binary hits, rank one or two, and one miss, rank three or four. Sessions earning low ratings produced one hit and six misses. This relationship between session quality and ESP success was statistically significant. A second formal series was started in mid-1988. Again, 20 sessions were planned, but Carpenter was no longer expecting overall evidence of ESP. He predicted that the better quality sessions would show ESP while the poorer sessions would not. Among the early hits of this series was the session that I described at the beginning of this section. Altogether, this series produced 12 hits and 8 misses, but more importantly, the results confirmed the relationship between session quality and ESP scores. Excluding four sessions in which the ratings fell exactly in the middle of the range, the higher quality sessions produced seven hits and one miss, whereas the poorer quality sessions produced two hits and six misses. Again, the results were statistically significant. As I write this, a third formal series is underway. Sessions are still on Thursdays, but after the research meeting now, and they have moved to Carpenter's nearby clinical offices, through the, though the targets are still selected at our lab. Today's session produced a striking hit, as did last week's, but it is too early to say how the series is going. It is clear, however, that Carpenter and his colleagues, for it is truly a group effort, are blazing an important new trail in the search for understanding how ESP may function in our emotional lives. Precognition by any other name is the name of the next section. Ed May, Ed, M-A-Y is his last name, Ed May, stared silently at the line in the graphs on the computer screen. Every few seconds he would strike one of the keys and a fresh line would zigzag its way across the screen and the graphics graphs would change. These days, May was spending a lot of time staring at computer screens, but most of the time he was staring at reports and spreadsheets in his capacity as director of the parapsychology research program at Stanford Research Institute. Yes, the same organization that did the remote viewing, SRI for short. It is no small job running parapsychology's only multi-million dollar research contract. At the moment, however, he was wearing a different hat. May, a senior staff scientist at SRI, was acting as his own subject in an experiment that he had designed with Dean Radin, a human factors psychologist on loan to SRI from AT&T Bell Laboratories. The screen that he stared at was not so flashy and colorful like the ESP tests used by labs that rely on subjects of the general public. The screen on his ESP test conveyed just the essential, essential information to tell him how he was performing. In recent years, SRI has been drawing its subjects from among its own scientists and other staff so that they keep their displays utilitarian, the way the scientists like it. Besides, this was not really an ESP test either. It was a test of intuitive data sorting, to quote. May and Raiden were working on a problem that traces its roots back to Schmidt's first three experiments. As we saw, Schmidt recognized that the precognition experiments with his atomic RNG could also be testing psychokinesis. The subject may have been causing a particular light to come on, rather than predicting which one would come on. There are now hundreds of PK experiments in which subjects try to make the lights come on in a certain way. These comprise a massive database showing unequivocally that something other than chance is operating. Is it PK? That is what many parapsychologists would say, but May and Raiden are trying to turn the tables on them. Instead of arguing that precognition experiments with RNGs might really be PK, May and Raiden are gathering evidence to show that PK experiments with RNGs are really precognition. The mathematics behind their argument derived from information theory and are too complicated to go into here, but their essential point is that the subjects in PK experiments are not affecting the RNG by PK. They are using precognition to know when to start the series of trials to take advantage of momentary short-term biases that are normal in RNGs. The experiment May was engaged in is a prototype of what he and Raiden think might be happening in RNG PK experiments. Each time May hit the key, he initiated a run of a certain number of individual binary, or two-choice, trials. 
May's task was to accumulate as many ones as possible out of a random string of ones, sorry, zeros and ones. The moving line and the graphs on the screen told him how successful he was on each run. Superficially, this experiment looks like many PK experiments in which the experimenter asks the subject to make the RNG produce more ones than zeros. But in this case, PK is impossible. Why? PK was impossible in this experiment for the same reason it was not possible in Schmidt's third experiment. The random numbers are not truly random, but instead came from a source of pseudo-random numbers. The SRI experiments used a pseudo-random number generator, or PRNG, of the type commonly used by computer scientists for modeling situations that require a certain amount of unpredictable behavior. A PRNG works by using a seed number in a mathematical formula and calculating from that an indefinitely long sequence of random numbers. While these sequences will appear to be random for most practical purposes, they differ from Schmidt's atomic RNG in an important way. They do not come from a true random, for example, subatomic decay process. The PRNG sequences are completely determined by the seed number and the mathematical formula. If you give the PRNG the same seed number a second time, you will get precisely the same sequence of random numbers. Since the PRNG sequences depend on the starting seed numbers, the crucial part of the experiment lies in the way these seed numbers are selected. The experiment was programmed to take a number derived from the computer's internal clock at the moment the key was pressed and use this to generate the fixed length of binary random numbers that comprised one trial. The computer clock ticked at the rate of 50 times a second and the program was set up to have 10,000 different seed numbers. In the same way that sometimes one will get 8 heads in 10 coin flips just by chance, some of those seed numbers would produce strings with more hits than others. To succeed in the test, the subject had to press the key at the right moment to grab a good seed number as they flew by with the ticks of the clock. The Raiden May experiment involved prediction within a very tight window, 20 milliseconds to be precise. In fact, for the average person, reaction time is typically several times greater than the window of opportunity in the Raiden May experiment. Thus, even if the subject were told that a good seed number was coming, he would not be able to press the button fast enough to catch it. The idea that a person could predict when to initiate the muscular movements that will result in a key press at precisely the right 20 millisecond movement moment seems absolutely mind-boggling. Yet that is exactly what the SRI experiment demonstrated. Both May and the other SRI subject were able to predict the right moment to hit the key so that they could get the better sequences. In the terminology coined by the SRI researchers, the subjects used intuitive data sorting to sort the good sequences, those with more ones, from the rest. To the rest of us, that looks like precognition. The control tests that Raiden and May conducted were just as important as the subject performance. These tests verified that the available seed numbers produced a properly random distribution of scores and that the seed numbers and the PRNG sequences had not been affected by PK. The most interesting control test, however, was one that asked what if the subject had pressed the key one clock tick, or 20 milliseconds, before or after he or she actually did. In fact, they examined the what if possibility for five clock ticks before and after the key press. Only the key press at the precise moment chosen by the subject yielded significant scores. Raiden and May not only demonstrated precognition, but also that it could be effective within a 20 millisecond window. The next section is slow but steady progress, and that's before the next chapter. In most sciences, for every flashy, headline-grabbing experiment, there are many, many studies that more prosaically lay the groundwork and later replicate and confirm the findings. In this respect, parapsychology is no different from its fellow sciences. Throughout the period that I have been considering a as I have been <laughs> throughout the period that I have been considering as contemporary ESP research, there have been far more experiments than the few that we have looked at in this chapter. For every one on which we have focused, there have been dozens of similar experiments that have not been as groundbreaking nor have used such interesting personalities as these. Not every one has obtained significant positive results, but many have. Quite frankly. Not all have been as well conducted as these, but most of them meet the exacting standards that publication in the professional journals of parapsychology requires. We have seen free response research, 
move from a creative reemergence in parapsychology through the dream ESP research to arrive at its present place as the cornerstone of one of parapsychology's most robust experimental techniques, the Gansfeld. We have seen the Gansfeld experiment win grudging acceptance from some of parapsychology's toughest critics, even if only to the point that they agree that something is happening. We've also seen the free response approach adopted by researchers who are pushing to develop practical applications of psi ability in the form of remote viewing. The preferred method of the pioneers of parapsychology, forced choice, continues to be a mainstay for parapsychologists, particularly for investigators of precognition. Technological advances and the experimental ingenuity of scientists such as Helmut Schmidt have virtually removed this line of research from debates about the methodological quality of the research, and increasingly critics are left with nothing to criticize. Is the breakthrough in understanding ESP just around the corner? Probably not. A century of research has taught us that those elusive human abilities that we now label psychic will not favor us with breakthroughs. At best, we can hope for a gradual increase in our understanding of the mind's mysteries born of patient and meticulous experimentation. The past two decades have certainly fulfilled that hope, and I have no doubt that the next decades will continue to do so. The next chapter, chapter six, is contemporary psychokinesis research. And it starts with, on a Friday evening in October 1970, Gaither Pratt and his associate, Champ Ransom, waited nervously in their Leningrad hotel room. Pratt and Ransom were experiencing the anxious anticipation that comes with the possibility of seeing a miracle, but not quite knowing if it will take place. And I think that's a good cliffhanger. So I'll leave you there. Next time we'll be on Chapter 6. Again, the book is Parapsychology by Richard S. Broughton. And there are links below in the description that will help you buy your own copy if you're interested in it. Awesome book, even great as a reference book, and uh, of course it also refers you to many other good books, and papers and such. And I hope you're enjoying it as much as I have been.